This program, Words Like Freedom, will feature Clint Smith, author of How the Word is Passed, and moderator Dr. Andrea Roberts, June 19th, 12 p.m. Available for purchase online from the Schomburg Shop at schombergshop.com is the featured book, How the Word is Passed. And good morning, and happy Juneteenth. Welcome to the third annual Schomburg Center Literary Festival, and I am Dr. Andrea Roberts. I'm founder of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project and assistant professor of urban planning at Texas A&M University. And today we celebrate Juneteenth as both a milestone in African-Americans' long struggle for racial justice and human rights. And along the way, we've been uh, on the pursuit of freedom through education, through reading, and through literacy. And so today it's only fitting that we celebrate the written word. And the man I will be interviewing today gives voice to many of those ancestral struggles for truth telling and telling our story and passing the word. I'm in conversation with Dr. Clint Smith uh, to discuss how the word is passed, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America. And I will remind you that books can be purchased using uh, the link below or by going to schomburgshop.com. I wanna also thank our ASL interpreter and live captioner for joining us today. And if you have questions uh, for Clint Smith, uh, he'll be glad to answer them. Please send them anytime using the chat. And to find out about all the rest of the literary festival events, please go to Schomburg Center List Fest, uh, litfest.org. And a little more about Clint Smith. He's a staff writer at The Atlantic and author of the poetry collection, Counting Descent. He has won the 2017 Literary Award for Best Poetry Book from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association and was a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. He's received fellowships from the New America Foundation, the Emerson Collective, the Art for Justice Fund, Cave Canem, and the National Science Foundation. And his writing has been published in The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, Poetry Magazine, and the Paris Review, and many other publications. He was born and raised in New Orleans and received his Bachelor of Arts in English from Davidson College and his PhD in Education from Harvard University. And as I mentioned before, I'm Dr. Andrea Roberts, and my work is about telling the story of the origin stories of historic African-American settlements founded after Juneteenth through the Depression in Texas. I'm creator of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project Atlas and study a visual history database and map filled with descendants origin stories of Texas's more than 500 African-American settlements. I'm also a 2021 Whiting Public Engagement Fellow and I was a 2020 visiting scholar at Yale's Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery Res uh, Resistance and Abolition. And I'm currently at work uh, on a book about Black historic preservation practice, the University of Texas Press, and a incredible fan of this work. And I'm most excited today to hear from Clint Smith as he shares his own work. Clint? Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. Um, it is uh, such a pleasure to be here. I was just telling folks before, I only wish we could be here together in person, um, but hopefully that is coming soon. Um, but I am grateful to share this virtual space with you all. Um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm a poet um, and I'm a poet and a journalist and a, and a scholar. And so I try to um, reject sort of singular disciplinary boundaries or boundaries of genre and uh, am very much part of the tradition of, of I think, um, or take, the take on the tradition of Black studies and African American studies of, of folks who um, recognize the uh, necessity of, of moving between genres and, and disciplines in order to tell the fullest, most nuanced, most complex and honest story about our people. Um, and so part of what I try to do in How the Word is Passed is sort of meld and bring these different genres together. But by my origin, uh, story is that of a poet um, as a writer. And so poems are both the, the creation of art, uh, but all the mechanism, also the mechanism through which I do my best thinking. And I think poetry has taught me how to pay attention, um, which has been beneficial both in my artistic 
and literary life, but also in, in my personal life. Uh, I think it forces you to reflect, forces you to pay attention. It, it pushes you to uh, wrestle with questions even when you might not necessarily come out with a specific, uh, specific answer. And so I say all that to say poetry very much informs this text, even though it is a narrative nonfiction book, um, it is informed by um, my background as, as a poet. And so when I was wrestling, when I was thinking about some of these issues that come up in the book, I was thinking about, uh, I was originally exploring them through poems. And so I'm gonna share with you all uh, a piece that's an adaptation from the book, um, because sometimes as a poet writing nonfiction, you write a poem and then you take the stanzas and make them into paragraphs, take the line breaks, make them into commas and periods and, and just throw it on the page. So um, this is an excerpt from the book um, and it is reflective of the sort of uh, origin. This is in many ways the poem that uh, served as catalyst for, for the project itself. Growing up, the iconography of the Confederacy was an ever-present fixture of my daily life. Every day on the way to school, I passed a statue of PGT Beauregard riding on horseback, his Confederate uniform slung over his shoulder, and his military cap pulled far down over his eyes. As a child, I did not know who PGT Beauregard was. I did not know he was the man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. I did not know he was one of the architects who designed the Confederate battle flag. I did not know he led an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery. What I knew is that he looked like so many of the other statues that ornamented the edges of this city. These copper garlands of a past that saw truth as something that should be buried underground and silenced by the soil. After the war, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy reshaped the contours of treason into something they could name as honorable. They called it the lost cause, and it crept its way into textbooks that attempted to cover up a crime that was still unfolding. It told us that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man, guilty of nothing but fighting for the state and the people that he loved, that the Southern flag was about heritage and remembering those slain fighting to preserve their way of life. But see, the thing about the lost cause is that it's only lost if you're not actually looking. The thing about heritage is that it's a word that also means I'm ignoring what we did to you. I was taught the Civil War wasn't about slavery, but I was never taught how the declarations of Confederate secession had the promise of human bondage carved into its stone. I was taught the Civil War was about states' rights, but I was never taught how the Fugitive Slave Act could care less about a border and spell Georgia and Massachusetts the exact same way. I was taught that the war was about economics, but I was never taught that in 1860, the four million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory, and railroad combined. It's easy to look at a flag and call it heritage when you don't see the black bodies buried behind it. It's easy to look at a statue and call it history when you ignore the laws written in its wake. I come from a city abounding with statues of white men on pedestals and black children playing beneath them, where we played trumpets and trombones to drown out the Dixie song that still whistled in the wind. In New Orleans, there are over 100 schools, roads, and buildings named for Confederates and slaveholders. Every day, Black children walk into buildings named after people who never wanted them to be there. Every time I return home, I drive on streets named for those who would have wanted me in chains. Go straight for two miles on Robert E. Lee, take a left on Jefferson Davis, make the first right on Claiborne translation, go straight for two miles on the general who slaughtered hundreds of black soldiers who were trying to surrender, take a left on the president of the Confederacy who made the torture of black bodies the cornerstone of his new nation, make the first right on the man who permitted the heads of rebelling slaves to be put on stakes and spread across the city in order to, pre to prevent the others from getting any ideas. What name is there for this sort of violence? What do you call it when the road you walk on is named for those who imagined you under a noose? What do you call it when the roof over your head is named after people who would have wanted the bricks to crush you? I really appreciate most about your book is your embrace of poetics and foregrounding story, storytelling and poetics. I relate to that as a scholar who works in the social sciences, but is very much trying to foreground humanistic inquiry. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I experienced while reading your book uh, is what I saw is you not necessarily interested in these stories just for the truth they hold, but what they make us feel. Mm. 
what these stories compel us to do and what origin stories compel some of us to avoid. Mm. And many of us want to avoid the visual experiences you described, many of which make me sit, take the book, put it down a second, mm. and really take in what it is you were, were sharing with us about the sheer terror, torture, and tenacity of African-Americans throughout history in this country. And throughout your writing, your poets made may the, the reader feel the banal yet palpable feel of the death chambers and Angola prison, the Middle Passage, child enslavement on the Whitney plantation. And the Gory Island chapter, what came into focus were what I think are some of the major contributions of, of your book, which is there are major gaps in the historical record and filling those gaps is important. But number two, sometimes the facts are not enough and people must be made to feel or empathize with those enduring past and present oppression. Did you wanna write a book that made people feel so they could think? And do you think this is the approach necessary for engagement around the racial justice issues that we're, we're facing today? Hmm, I appreciate the, the, the question and, and the deep engagement with the text. I should also say this is the period um, where I qualify that I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And so any background noise that you hear, um, whether it be screaming or laughing or some combination of the two is uh, because the walls in our house are quite thin and, uh, and it is Saturday and they are home. So, um, but with that said, I, it is, I wouldn't say that, uh, I would never suggest that the, the method or the, the way that I wrote this book or the set of questions I'm wrestling with or the, the way I approached this project was the only way, or even the best way, um, to to wrestle with these topics. I think you know there are a myriad of different uh, scholars and artists and journalists and uh, media figures who who are tackling these issues in ways that are um, are deeply have left deep impacts on me. Uh, and part of what I am trying to do is is provide one contribution to this vast ocean of scholarship and media and information um, that that can serve as, as one entry point for people maybe who, who are not as familiar with the historiography of slavery um, into that world, into that space. Um, and in terms of what I wanted the book to do, I mean, I have spent the past several years uh, deeply engaged in, in books that are in scholarship on the history of slavery. Uh, many of them behind me, the Hemings is a Monticello, by Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, Dinah Ramey Berry, Slavery in New York, Ira Berlin and Leslie Harris, Soul by Soul, Walter Johnson, um, Race and Reunion, David Blight, the list goes on and on. And these books have radically transformed me and my understanding of what this country's history is mm -hmm. and, the, and our, our temporal proximity to the history of slavery, right? That this thing that I was taught in my elementary school was as if it was something that happened in the Jurassic age, right? That it was like the dinosaurs and the Flintstones and slavery um, wasn't actually that long ago. And I think when you spend time with these scholars and their work, you get a, a more intimate sense of um, our proximity to that period, of history, his, uh, that period of history. And part of what I wanted to do was amplify that intimacy. Uh, and I thought one of the best ways of doing that was by going physically to the places. Um, and and because it's one thing to, to read about a slave cabin, and it's another thing to walk inside of one, to hear the way the wood moans under your feet when, when you step inside, to see the way that uh, sunlight sort of slides in through cracks in the wood, and to recognize how susceptible to the elements these families living in, in these small cramped spaces would have been. Um, I think it just creates a different sort of sensory experience, a different emotional texture. And who, who are the people who are responsible for cultivating these stories and curating this land? Who, what are their backgrounds? What do their voices sound like? What does the land look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? And so what I wanted to do was bring that sort of sensory experience to the, uh, to the history and to the scholarship. Um, mm. And also to hear the voices of the people who are are telling the story of that land, whether they're telling the story of that land really well and really effectively and really honestly, or whether they're telling the story of that land in a way that uh, fundamentally distorts the history that took place on. And so uh, what I find really interesting, of course, is that 
we are having this discussion today on Juneteenth. Yesterday, uh, we know that Juneteenth became a federal holiday and it becomes a federal holiday in a time in which we struggle with uh, this country, especially in Texas, wanting to confront difficult history. Mm. And also in real time, all of us struggling with what it means for Juneteenth to suddenly become a federal holiday, this great celebration of freedom. And at the same time, uh, the individuals voting for us uh, for, this, for this federal holiday, passage of that, that bill, uh, not voting for a number of uh, laws that would actually catalyze freedom or liberation or justice, right? And part of that, I think, is already starting with the way that we're remembering why we're where we are. So uh, in part, we owe this celebration to Opal Lee. Uh, but what I really appreciated in your book was also uh, elevating uh, the memory now of the late uh, State Representative Al Edwards. And can you talk about meeting him? You talk about it in the book and talk about where we find ourselves too with thinking about how we got here, what Juneteenth is and its meaning today and, and, and a little about celebrating it in Galveston. Yeah, so uh, I went to Galveston. Uh, I think it's the fifth chapter of the book, mm -hmm. fifth section. Um, and I went two years ago for the um, Juneteenth uh, annual prayer breakfast um, organized by Al Edwards or in honor of uh, mm -hmm. the late Al Edwards. And I went and this was a year before he passed he passed last year um, and so I really wanted to spend time with this this person who who from everything I had read was so central um, to the to advocating uh, and pushing forward the legislation that ultimately made Juneteenth a state holiday in Texas uh, and and more uh, to a point that you brought up before we uh, before we went live that he was so central um, to the community and so beloved in the community and respected in the community um, and was really working, truly working on behalf of them in ways that we don't, people don't always feel like their representatives are. Um, and, and also to spend time, again, just, I think there's something about spending time in a place where history happened. Um, and so, you know, the mythology uh, around uh, Juneteenth is that General Gordon Granger made the announcement from the balcony of Ashton Villa in Galveston. Um, and you know, I, scholars have not found any evidence to to support that claim necessarily, but but I think sometimes what happens is people turn myth and symbols into tradition, and so each year that community celebrates Juneteenth in that space, and and it was just such a powerful experience to be there with hundreds of Galvestonians, some of whom are the descendants of people who learned of their freedom that yes. day, right? And and it would gave me a sense of. Uh, how them for for those folks this was not an abstraction this was not merely a holiday this was this was real this was something this was an heirloom this is what made their lives possible um and they felt it in their bones in their marrow and and so there was one moment where we were uh they were singing the the, the black national anthem um and uh, lift every voice and sing and, and you know i grew up in Black church, black family, this, I've heard this song in many spaces on many occasions, hundreds of times. There was something about being in that room with those people singing that song and listening to the, and, and it was almost as if I was hearing the lyrics for the first time because, because it was this moment celebrating emancipation, celebrating freedom, um, all, but also mourning all that had had to be done in order to reach that moment. Also mourning the fact that this was kept from uh, black folks in Texas for two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, two months after General Lee surrendered at Appomattox effectively ending the Civil War. And, and I think that that is what Juneteenth is. It's this sort of both endedness. It's this recognition of the mourning of what was kept from black people while also celebrating the end of one of the most egregious things that this country has ever yes. done. And what I think of when I think of Juneteenth most concretely is that slavery existed in this country for around 250 years and black folks were fighting to end, end the institution from the moment we arrived on these shores, right? So resistance was taking place 
since the first uh, 20 some odd Africans arrived uh, in, on the coast of Virginia um, in the American colonies and, and happened until 1865. And what that reminds us is that the vast majority of people who fought against slavery, who fought for freedom, who fought for emancipation and abolition, never had the opportunity to experience it for themselves. But they fought for something and knew that they were fighting for something that they might never see, but fought for it anyway. And mm -hmm. I think for me, it is so, it's such an important and humbling reminder of the work that we do during our time on earth, that sometimes we are fighting for a better, more just, more equitable world that we might never see but we don't fight for it so that we can necessarily experience the fruits of our labor. We fight for it because someday someone will. And my life right now is only possible because of people who fought for something they knew they might never see. And what is that, what responsibilities does that lay on me to yes. do the same for folks that I might never see? It really uh, causes us to conceptualize ourselves as links in a chain rather than mm -hmm. just the oh, we're the wildest dream. No, we are part of this ongoing struggle, right? Yeah. And uh, that leads me to think about, you know, you mentioned the our arrival on these shores and it made me think about your selection of sites that you decided to, to, to write about in this book. And all of your sites except Gory Island are here. Um, and can you talk about the reasons you selected these specific places and were they meant or selected to catalyze the reckoning with slavery in your, in your, in your title? You know, you mentioned this being about a reckoning with slavery in our landscape, in our communities, our schools, our politics, in our present. What's the relationship between those sites you selected and that intent that I see in the book? Yeah, I, what I wanted to do was create a sort of a, a quilt uh, or sort of patchwork of places that reflect the myriad of ways that slavery is remembered and misremembered across this country. Mm -hmm. So this book is written about uh, nine places if we include the prologue and the epilogue. Um, and, but I could have written about 100,000 and nine, right? Like slavery is etched into the landscape of this country in innumerable spaces and in, 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 in innumerable ways. And so what I, you know, part of, I went to dozens of places that end, didn't end up in the book, um, but that very much informed how I wrote about certain places. And, and I think that I, I just wanted to capture places at, at sort of both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between. So I wanted to go to um, uh, Whitney Plantation, which is the only plantation in Louisiana that centers the lives of enslaved people in its plantation tour of curation. Um, one of the only places in the country that centers the lives of enslaved people. And the thing about the Whitney is that it's surrounded by a constellation of plantations where people continue to hold weddings, where the, the tours uh, barely mention, if at all, the enslaved people who live there, where people continue to have uh, celebrate these weddings and occasions. And, and some uh, wedding planners I've even spoken to said that there are people who use the former slave cabins as bridal suites for the events. Um, and so you have that on one end of the spectrum, right? That the Whitney is situated in this place attempting to resist all that is happening around it. And then you have a place like um, uh, the Blandford Cemetery in uh, Petersburg, Virginia, which is one of the right. largest Confederate cemeteries in the country, a uh, place where the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are buried. And I went there for the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration. Um, so as you can imagine, I was a very conspicuous presence at Probably. Event. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was a, a completely different experience because I was seeing the contemporary manifestation of the lost cause. And I was seeing the way that for so many people, history is not about empirical evidence or primary source documents or what actually happened. It is simply a story that they are told. And it is a story that they tell. Uh, it is something that is passed down over generations in which people's sense of history is deeply entangled in their emotional and intimate relationships with people they love. It's their core and story. It's the, it's core to how they understand who they are in the world, how they situate themselves and their sense of meaning and value and purpose um, in our in our country today. And, and if they were to accept a different story, the true story, um, it would it would crumble the narrative that has allowed them to understand 
their family and themselves in, uh, in a way that gives themselves meaning. And so uh, it is an existential uh, question and crisis for them in so ways. And so these are places that represent two ends of the spectrum and I try to capture sort of everywhere else in between. It seems that you learned a great deal about yourself and your own origin story in writing this book. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so um, I wondered, you know, as I was reading the epilogue, I, which I found to be sort of a, a master class in interviewing our elders as someone who does a lot of ethnographic research and interviewing, uh, I found it to be uh, very revealing of the challenges in trying to have these conversations especially in the exchanges with your grandfather, for example. And can you tell us about that experience of, you know, your discussion with your grandfather and tell us why it was important to include that exchange in discussion alongside the other chapters about monuments and historic sites? Yeah, I think part of what happened is I, I was working on this book uh, for four years and I was probably about halfway through when I realized that I, uh, had spent so much time deeply engaged with books and scholarship and articles on the history of uh, slavery and racism in this country, the history of white supremacy and all the insidious ways it has manifested itself. I've talked to, uh, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of people, um, asking them questions about their lives, trying to understand who they are and what their lives, life stories reveal about how they tell these stories or understand these stories. And I, really, I just had a moment where I realized that I had never been that, as intentional with members of my own family. Like I never, I sat, I sit down, you know, between my dissertation and this book and everything else, I just interviewed hundreds of people. And I was like, I've never interviewed my grandparents. I you know. know. And, like, and why was that? And the thing is, as you get older and the more, you know, the, the only times I would see them were, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and, you know, you have young kids and you're like, more focused on trying to not have your toddler throw macaroni across the table <laughs> right. than you are and like being able to have a meaningful yeah. exchange with um, my parents. So I wanted to, I wanted to sit down with them and just really get a sense of, of the stories that I had never gotten a chance to ask them to tell. Um, and, and part of what it reminded me of, and I write this in the book, is that sometimes the best primary sources are the people right next to us. Sometimes we don't have to look that far. Um, and I think it also reveals, again, the, the, the book is trying to reveal both our physical proximity to this history, our temporal proximity, mm -hmm. but also our sort of relational and familial proximity, right? And I think when I, I, I spoke to, when I was talking to my grandfather and other members of my family, I had this moment, I was like, my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, right? So when my four-year-old son is sitting on my grandfather's lap, I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm again reminded that this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago, wasn't that long ago at all. Wasn't that long ago. Like it, it was so recent. Um, and when I went through, we part of the, the conceit of the chapters that before this, I had walked through the National Museum of African American History and Culture with them. Um, and, and I think I didn't even realize it at the time. I wrote a piece for the Paris Review about it when it was happening and I was like, I was walking, you know, that I walked through this museum documenting so much of the history and violence that my grandparents had experienced themselves. And then I sort of built the interviews off that. But when I was asking my grandmother about our time in the museum uh, and how she experienced it, she was just like, I lived it, I lived it. And that was the refrain, she kept saying, I lived it. Like the things we were seeing on the wall, the things in these exhibits, the things in these black and white photos, I lived it. Um, and it was just, I think that, that is how I wanted to end the book because it was a reminder both for me and for the reader, um, again, that this is in, in the scope of human history, this thing was just yesterday. It was just yesterday. <laughs> and, you know, as someone who's from Texas, sixth generation Texan, but didn't come to this knowledge of my own story and its value and how that would shape what I, what I do with my life, I absolutely relate to that realization. Can you tell us about what this book, how it's changed you, the experience of writing it, and how it may influence what you do next? I think, well, the, what people should know is that this book is not written um, by someone who began this project as an expert on slavery. Um, the book is in many ways an attempt to fill the gaps uh, in my own childhood, you know, mm -hmm. to, to learn the sort of things that I wish I had learned in my eighth grade 
social studies class, in my US history class in high school, the things that are so central to understanding this country that I simply never, never learned. And that, and because I never learned them, I think I had a, a sort of intellectual or psychological paralysis in which mm -hmm. this country was telling me so many things about people who looked like me and what was wrong with us and what we were, how we should be better. Um, and, and there wasn't, I didn't have the language or the toolkit with which to push back against it. I didn't have the history or the sociological frameworks with which to reject so many of the things that this country was telling me about myself. And I think about this James Baldwin essay, uh, A Talk to Teachers from 1963. Uh, and, and in it, Baldwin says, the role of the teacher, because uh, it, it's a, based on a speech that he gave to a group of New York City educators, says the role of the teacher is to help the black child, or he's saying that black children are told over and over and over again by this world that they are criminal. And the role of the teacher, and he's saying teacher here literally, but also using it as a metonym for the larger society, the role mm -hmm. of the teacher is to help that child understand that they are not criminal, but it is the society and the history that created the conditions that that child is forced to grow up in that is in fact the criminal. And mm -hmm. for many of us, that's intuitive, but I think we can underestimate the extent to which so many young people are growing up with the opposite framework, the extent to which I did, right? The extent to which I didn't have uh, that language and power. So the book, I think it changed me because I just, I, I, it was so clarifying in so many different respects. It was so, it gave me new eyes with which to understand this country. It gave me new eyes with which to more, more acutely understand, because I think I understood in an abstract way, but more acutely understand how our social, political, and economic infrastructure are, are inextricably linked to the history of chattel slavery in this country. Not like informed by or like carrying a little bit of remnants of but part like and fundamentally of, shaped yes. Yes, by that history. Um, and I, I learned so much and in how it will affect the decisions I make moving forward. I mean, I, I learned a lot about myself as a writer. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting. I'm a staff writer at the Atlantic now. I was not when I was writing this book. I had no conception of myself as as like a journalist. Um, even now, as people were sort of reviewing the book, they're like, poet and journalist, Clint Smith. I was like, who's a journalist? Um, really? No, wait man. a minute. I really thought of you as, a, that's so funny. Uh, I, I did I not think of myself that same. way. Yeah. Yeah, I did not think of myself at all. I mean, I was a graduate student when I was writing this, um, but I, the, I, going up to people and asking them questions and interviewing them is uh, not a natural part of my ethos. Um, but I, I realized that it transformed what the book would be, um, specifically at Monticello when I went up and started having conversations with folks whose understanding of Jefferson was fundamentally different than my own. Yes. Um, it, it made clear to me that this project necessitated other voices. It couldn't just be the extended meditations and my own reflections on these places. It had to include the reflections and meditations of others. Um, and so as a writer, I mean, I think I learned how to become a journalist. Um, and, in, and in some way, I took the best of, you know, I was like in ethnography classes in graduate school, and I was freelancing. And so I think I, I took the best of the ethnographic work that I learned about, I took right. the best of the sort of journalistic work I know, learned about. And like we said before, I just tried to, you know, figure out the best way, regardless of genre, regardless of form, regardless of um, discipline to, to reflect and tell, um, to tell these stories. And so I think it, I became a much better writer as I, I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And I think I, it, it allowed me to bring in the different parts of my writerly self um, in a way that I, I hope to be able to continue to do in projects moving forward. So before we go into Q&A, I have one more question around, um, again, this, this far reaching book, uh, that I think will catalyze significant dialogues, conversations, and a real reckoning, uh, not just confrontation and education, but catalyzing a sort of process of repentance for some, uh, possibly. And so in the field of education, where you have worked for some time, what do you think, uh, how rather do you think this book might help fill gaps in public education itself? Do you see it as a tool uh, to be used in, in classrooms in a particular way? 
I can't say uh, how it will be used, but I certainly hope that it is a helpful intervention. I mean, I wrote at what I write in at the end of the book um, in my sort of brief you know, about this book um, section uh, is that I, I wanted to write the sort of book that I would have wanted to teach, um, both the sort of book that I would have wanted to read when I was a young person and the sort of book that I would have wanted to teach when I was a high school teacher. Um, and, you know, I wanted it to feel I wanted it to, to cite and credit and pay homage to and lift up the, the work of historians and public historians who've been doing this work for, for decades and, and hopefully have this serve as an entry point into folks engaging with their work. Um, yes. And I also am a deep believer in, in like meeting people where they are, right? So I think that this book is one tool and one intervention I also am the host of a, a YouTube series called Crash Course Black American History, which is sort of a, a 10 minute history lessons, you know, if you will, that, that are like partially animated um, that tackle the history of, of Black folks in this country. So it just started, we're only on number seven. I think we just released the episode of uh, Phyllis Wheatley yesterday. Um, and so if you just Google Crash Course Black American History um, or put it into YouTube, that should come up. But, but I, I, you know, I hope, Many people read the book. I also recognize that for a variety of reasons, not everybody's going to pick up a, a 300 page book. Um, and, and I want, I want to al always be figuring and thinking about different mediums through which to pro provide folks with this information um, who may not be inclined to engage with it through traditional ways. And maybe hopefully that the video, maybe hopefully the video, um, I, I got a message, uh, a kind message from the, the great scholar, writer, thinker, um, activist, uh, Mariam Kaba, who said her godson watched the video we did on the transatlantic slave trade and then asked her for, for some additional reading. Um, and that's the dream. That's the dream that's that, that a 13 year old watches that video and it's like, I should learn more about this. Um, and so, yeah, I just hope that to whatever extent I can be uh, a bridge or vessel an entry point yes. into the folks engaging with this amazing, beautiful body of scholarship more more thoroughly. So mention you, you mentioned this uh, uh, video project, which I want you to mention the name of again, and tell us what other projects you have in process or, or that are on the horizon. Yeah, so the, the name of the video again is Crash Course Black American History. So it's part of the Crash Course series. There's a whole, I mean, they do okay. philosophy, chemistry, US history, world history. Uh, and so I'm the host of Black American History. Um, and we drop a new episode every week. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing 50 episodes. And so we've only done seven. We put out seven so far. Um, so we have many more to go. Um, mm -hmm. And what I'm working on next, I think my next book is, uh, has a very different tenor. It's a, it's a collection of dad poems. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, poems that are, many of which are, are, have a lighter touch, I'll say, than in some of the... Um, and it's, you know, I, like I said, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and um, my entire experience writing this book has been animated by having two young children. Um, and those, I would sort of write those poems on the side um, and, and they would be a sort of a respite, um, like an artistic respite from the, the intensity of the subject matter that I was dealing with in the nonfiction book. Um, and so it's, it's like a, a a lot of meditations on um, the silly things, the joyful things, the hard things, the sleepless nights. Um, mm. But but that is uh, the crash course, which I'll continue to be working on over the next year. Um, those poems, which will, I'm not sure when that's supposed to come out. At some point, um, uh, probably depends on how this book moves in the world. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I just, I love, I love writing. I love writing and then experimenting in different genres i'd love to write i'd love to write fiction i'd love to write plays i'd love to just you know think about the different ways to tell stories i'm just mm -hmm. so interested by all of them um and so so we'll see we'll yeah. see i think i'm gonna take a long vacation in august That's what <laughs> i would imagine because i just thought about you being in all of those spaces and tasking yourself with writing about them is one one thing, but even just going to them and experiencing what you experience in those spaces is a lot. 
And at this time, I just want to remind the audience that we invite your questions, uh, share them in the chat, and I'll be more than happy uh, to share them uh, with Clint Smith, who's here to answer your questions. And again, I was thinking about the intensity of Gory Island, the intensity of going on that tour through New York City. And you really uh, captured the atmospherics of New York City. I lived in New York City. I went to school at Vassar, undergrad. And that, that, that's a very difficult place to get a feel for what the past was like, mm. you know? And I wondered if you could say anything about uh, how you learned to write so well about the atmosphere and the layers of cultural landscapes and temporality, you know, what it was at this time versus this time. It just, you, you, had, you just really mastered that ability to capture past and present so well. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Uh, I love historical fiction. Um, and so I think uh, books of historical fiction um, do that really well. As you know, I pulled a lot from poetics, but I also, uh, I wanted this book to feel like a novel in some ways. I wanted it to read sort of novelistic, like I wanted it to feel like you were alongside a journey um, in which in some ways I was the protagonist of that journey. Um, and and so, you know, I'm I'm obsessed with exposition and like sensory detail. Which, and mm. as a magazine writer, it's interesting because like um, you have you have more space than somebody who writes for a newspaper. But like yeah. I, when I remember when we were uh, my chapter on the Confederate Cemetery was adapted into a magazine piece um, that was the cover story of. Um, you have it here. It was the the cover story for yes. the Atlantic, um, which Great. was very cool and a very surreal moment. Um, but we had to cut it. The, the chapter is 17,000 words. And uh, the excerpt, I think, is 5,500. Um, and so it was it was painful. Um, <laughs> it, they, yeah. did an amazing, they did a great job. They did an amazing job. But I, I mean, I love scene setting. I love, again, just thinking about like, with the way the wind sounds when it just sort of swipes across your face, the way like what the leaves look like when they're being rustled by the leaves, what the, you know, the way the like pigeon on the sidewalk's neck moves and like the way that the sunlight hits the sort of uh, shimmering green color of its neck. I mean, I just, that's what I obsess over and love. And so in a magazine, they're like, cool, cool, cool. That's like, we don't need to know about the, the colorful neck of the pigeon right, now. <laughs> right. gotta keep the story moving. Um, but in a book, you have a little more room for that. Um, yeah. and, and so in, you know, New York is such a dynamic place and a dynamic city. Um, I, I, in some ways, wanted to capture the juxtaposition between the sort of bustling cosmopolitanism of New York today and its sense of itself with the fact that for an extended period of time, New York was the second largest slave port in the country after Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and that in 1860, the mayor of New York City, Fernando Wood, uh, actually proposed that New York City secede from the Union alongside with the Southern states because the political, social, and economic infrastructure of uh, that country or of that city were so deeply entangled with uh, the slaveocracy of the South. Um, yes. So, so that you know, that is a story of New York is, that is not one that I ever learned. Um, and yeah, I didn't learn. Uh, that was the one interesting thing to me was about the Statue of Liberty. And, yeah. and that story was fascinating as well. So there's a lot of stories here. Mm -hmm. That's why everyone needs to purchase the book. <laughs> the moral of the story is purchase the book, read the book, share the book. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Kalula Bates and everyone else as Sean Burke for giving me the privilege of being able to have this conversation with Clint Smith and be a part of the program today. I'm honestly um, just, just floored by this book and being able to, to speak with you, Clint. It was amazing and inspiring. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to announce uh, coming up next at uh, 1 Eastern on the Langston Hughes virtual stage will be a feature with Ben Okri, author of Prayer for the Living uh, with moderator Chris Albany at 115 on the Nella Larson virtual stage. You'll hear from honoree 
uh, uh, Fanon Jeffers, I'm a great fan of her work, uh, The Age of Phyllis and Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois. And joining her in conversation will be Joy Bivens, the director of the Schomburg. Uh, Clint, last words before we um, move to the next stage. Thank you everyone for, for being here. Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for uh, being in conversation. Um, and no, it's, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to see everyone when the Schomburg opens back up again, uh, opens back up again. And, uh, and everybody be safe and have a wonderful Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. Hey y'all, my name is Kendra Allen and I'm gonna be reading you a poem from my debut collection titled The Collection Plates. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm going to be reading you a poem about a mini Ripperton song that I'm sure everybody knows called Inside My Love. And um, it's an amazing poem. It's just so pretty. Like her voice. Okay. I'm going to read it from page six. And this poem is titled I'm the Note Held Toward the End. I'm the note held toward the end of inside my love, you know, when she's vanishing. To think one woman made two complete things in me about loving, about laying, yet I still don't know the difference between pleasure and penetration, or what to do with my hands in the middle of the kindest insertions. It ain't enough ring impossible to let go, turn into glitter, into powder, here's to well-rounded wound. Turn that sad shit up. Many swear it's tranquil to be permitted or water a whole nation with just a tip. I was only seven. If I can remember it right, I know if it won't fit to hold it inside all five fingers and squeeze. Thank you. So, what does freedom mean to me? Freedom to me really means risk. Um, being able to risk, being able to have the ability to change. And when I think of those words, I think of privilege. So I think freedom is definitely a privilege when it shouldn't be. It should just be something that everybody is allowed to experience for all of their lives. Um, but yeah, I think of it as a privilege. I think of it as ability. I'm a Sagittarius, so like I'm always, I need like the ability to get up and leave, to get up and move, to get up and like just do what I want to do. Um, so like freedom to me is everything. It's, it's boundlessness. Is that right? Boundlessness? Yeah, it's boundlessness. Okay. Um, the freedom practice that I want to portray in my work is to like break structural stereotypes because you know don't nobody got time for that I just want to be able to write and write the way I want to write and not technically think about like all those technical things that we learn in a classroom about writing I think that's where I'm like my best self so that is my freedom practice and my writer practice and um, what I want the reader from my work to walk away with is I want you to finish reading that mug and then when you done be like I want to read it again. That's my goal. Thank you so much for having me. I hope y'all have a great festival. Thank you.